From time to time, it gets really hard to find a very specific beer, but being a home brewer, that's easy to fix. What's up everybody, Just Brewin here. Welcome back to the home brewery for another grain to glass video. Today, we're gonna to be brewing a Flanders Red Ale. This is a sour that originated in West Flanders, Belgium. Um, and if I remember correctly, essentially it came down to uh, storing beer in casks and over time it would sour. And eventually they would mix that soured batch with newer fresh batches of beer, um, which would give us mildly sour beers. Um, this, uh, the, the beer itself, um, I'm trying to find what was a clone for a Duchess Flanders Red Ale that my wife really, really, really loved and it's a chocolate cherry sour. Um, it's been really hard to find, at least, you know, we, it's hard to find on shelves in Austin, Texas. Um, so why not brew it? Why not find a recipe online and brew it and brew it yourself? Now, the recipe that I have, the one that I'm following, is not a, an exact clone of the recipe. Really, it's a, a, a recipe for this style, and then I'm going about adding chocolate and cherry in the ways that I can. If this is the kind of content that you enjoy, make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you want to support me and the channel, you can visit justbrewing.com where you can make donations directly to me or justbrewing.com slash merch where you can pick up some merch from my store and all merch proceeds are going to be going to charity, specifically the Know Your Rights campaign. Without further ado, let's get to brewing. If you're looking for specifics on this recipe, like the water profile and water salt additions, check the link in the description. As usual, I'm going to be using my 120 volt claw hammer system. I like to use a grain bag in the grain basket. This helps me with cleaning up at the end of the day. I'm able to dump the grains a bit easier and it makes cleaning the basket much, much easier. It also gives me an opportunity to squeeze the bag and get a little bit more work and make up some gravity points if I was a little bit off. So it really has a couple purposes and really it, is, it takes almost no extra effort for some positive effects. We're gonna mash for one hour at 149 degrees Fahrenheit. I set my controller and make sure that everything is broken up. We're gonna need to make sure our controller is at about 154-ish degrees to keep our mash at about 149 degrees. To help maintain that temperature, we're gonna use this pump to circulate the work and make sure this keeps going for one hour. Your typical brew day at the end of your mash, you would yank your grains, get it to a boil, and follow some sort of hop schedule. When you're kettle souring, it's a little bit different. Your brew day is essentially split into parts. So in the first part, you're gonna be mashing and you do get it to a boil. So here I'm going to yank my grains, squeeze the bag, and get it ready for a boil. Typically, I would turn my controller up to 100%. But for something like this, it typically takes an hour or so for the system to get up to a boil from mash temp. So instead, I'm going to hook this up to my propane system. I'm gonna get it on a propane burner to get it to a boil for about five to 10 minutes, really only to kill any bacteria. I made sure this was safe by speaking with Kyle from Clawhammer, the owner, um, just to make sure that this is not a bad idea. And apparently people do this all the time. And in order to do it, you need to make sure your power cable is nice and secure and safe from the heat. I put it in a hop spider and then that inside a heat blanket. It's essentially used uh, typically to iron on top of tables and uh, washing machines and things like that. I'm going to use that uh, to keep the cable safe. I also take the jacket off just to make sure that's not going to catch fire either. Here's a behind the scenes look of my chilling. I've got the water going through my water hose, then through a pre-chiller, then into my jaded Scylla, and then back into what is a 20, 25 gallon kettle. This is essentially my sink if I'm not doing big batches. Once your wort is chilled down to a decent temperature, typically below 90 degrees, you can go about adding your lactobacillus. For me, I'm using Lacto by Omega Yeast, and if you're not familiar with it, lactobacillus is a strain of bacteria that eats away at some of the sugar in the wort and produces lactic acid, resulting in a sour beer. A lower pH um, means uh, it's essentially a souring effect for us, that's what it tastes like. And in this case, we are going to be adding some bacteria right into our kettle and we're going to use the electric element to turn on and off when needed to keep it around a certain temperature. Make sure to follow the manufacturer's suggestions on this. For Omega yeast, it's between 80 to 95 degrees. I always like to stay around the low to the middle range so that I can crank it up if I need to because I'm going to let this sit for about two to three days before getting back to it. I do end up moving it from, you know, the main part of my garage over to on top of my keyser just because I need the space back. And here's what it looks like about a day and a half in. And it's absolutely disgusting. If your fermenter like looks like this, it's time to dump it. But if you're kettle souring, that is exactly what you want to see. At the day of the second brew day, this is the what it looks like at its absolute worst. And that's disgusting. 
but an easy fix for that is you just get it to a boil. So I hook everything back up, get my controller to 100% before getting it to a boil. I'm gonna let it boil for about 10 to 15 minutes before adding my first hop addition, just to make sure that all the bacteria is for sure dead. We're gonna follow the on-screen hop schedule and get our first charge tossed in. With about 15 minutes left in our 60 minute boil, it'll be time to add our second and last hop addition. After this, I'm gonna get lower the temperature a little bit and add in some cacao nibs. Now, I haven't added that at the end of the boil before um, and it doesn't really turn out great. Uh, it doesn't turn out bad, but it didn't do what I wanted it to. So I'm gonna add some more chocolate later on, but I do wanna show, uh, I am, you know, this is a chocolate cherry sour and here is the first charge of chocolate. We chill all that down and get it into a sanitized bucket where it's gonna ferment at about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm gonna be using US05, one of the most simple, basic yeasts out there. I'm gonna use a very clean, neutral yeast to make sure that the sour and the chocolate and the cherry are all present in this beer. After about four days in the primary fermenter, it's time to add our Oregon Sweet Cherry Puree. I'm gonna add this at the bottom of my sanitized firmzilla and I'm going to rack my wort. I'm gonna rack that right on top of the puree to make sure that it mixes nice and evenly. Of course, we've got the inspector to come in. Ravioli has to check it out, make sure everything is safe and that this is a good idea. You do not move on without approval from the boss. It looks like the inspection is finishing up and everything looks good and we can move forward with racking the wort on top of our puree. Once it's done, it's time to seal it back up and get it back into the fermentation chamber where it will live for another week and a half or so for a total of three weeks in the fermenter. I am gonna make a tincture because I was not terribly happy with the lack of chocolate flavor in it at this point. So I make a tincture. If you wanna know how, just click the link in the corner here. I make a little bit of a mess before it's time to keg, carb, and get it ready for the tasting. Here it is, the chocolate cherry sour. On the color, this is about exactly what you would expect a Flanders red ale to look like. It is a little bit darker, but I think that's just because of the dark cherry puree that I added. On the nose, you do get some sweet, a little bit of sour, sourness as well. Quite a bit of cherry and a little bit of fruit character, and the flavors do come through. You get a little bit of chocolate, quite a bit of cherry, and then at the back end is just some nice, clean, balanced sourness. I've used lactobacillus in the past and it's almost always worked out really, really well. Um, this time was, you know, as usual, it's very hands off. You kind of just let, um, let the lacto do what it's gonna do. Um, and it worked out really, really well. It did get, uh, it wasn't as sour as I was hoping at first, but then I guess as it, as it developed a little bit, it did get to what I would call my exact preferred amount of sourness. Um, it, 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 is, it is sour, but it's not overbearing at all, and it doesn't leave you wanting, oh man, I wish this was more sour, because I've had quite a few of those beers. When it comes to the cherry, you do get quite a bit of that, and it is a bit balanced, and it's, as I mentioned, a little more on the sweet side, um, and I think that, that, that comes out really, really well. Um, with it already being a sour, I didn't want it to be sour and tart, so I did decide to go sweet on the cherry, and I think that worked out really well. It helped balance it all out. On the chocolate, I added it kind of twice, um, and I will probably never do that first method again. I probably won't add it at the end of the boil. Um, I've seen adding it in the boil and then, you know, before your hop addition, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't want this to become bitter because it was going to be sour. So I figured I didn't want it to be boiling for too long. Let me just toss it in for 15 minutes. Um, and it, it was there a little bit, but once the yeast kind of came in and it was USO5, so very simple, neutral yeast, but the chocolate flavor wasn't really in it um, kind of towards the tail end when, it, when fermentation was finishing up in the samples that I got. So that was when I decided to do the tincture. I was already stopping back at the homebrew store for a little bit, so I just grabbed some more cacao nibs and, and made a tincture. There are a lot of discussions online about using specific equipment for when you're doing sours or kettle sours in this case. Um, I haven't had any issues and I've done Philly sour a handful of times. I've kettle soured a handful of times now um, and haven't had any real issues. So, uh, but just to be safe, I did, you know, this is my, I kettle soured in my main brewing system. So I did do a PBW soak for about a day after, um, after it was done, after the boil and all that. 
um, and I did soak the bucket and all that. And when I was cleaning out the keys there, so I was like, you know what, we might as well do a PBW soak for everything. So uh, that was essentially what I did. I did clean it, so definitely go about cleaning it properly and using the right cleaner when you do it. Um, but when it comes to using specific equipment, I'm not gonna do that. I will continue to use my, my claw hammer system to brew. All the beers that I have lined up right now are all brewed on, my, on that system. Um, so that's not, that's not gonna change. When it comes to the bucket and the fermenting equipment, um, I don't ferment a whole lot of beers all, the, all at once. I mean, and when I do, you know, kind of the last couple of rounds, I have done like three and four beers all at once. Um, and this is kind of the way it worked out was I used the bucket that I used last time when I soured, mostly because I just didn't use that bucket again. Um, so I may just make that my souring bucket, but we'll see, it doesn't really matter. If something comes down to it and I have to use it, I will. And if I notice some ill, like some side effects, some ill off flavors, um, then I'll know what happened. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind for, you know, if on the off chance that does come up, but I'm not too worried about it and I don't think you should either, but definitely go about cleaning your equipment if you do kettle sour, because you are introducing bacteria, so you have to be able to clean that afterwards and boiling it does make sure there's no bacteria, but doesn't necessarily clean it. So definitely uh, follow your best practices when you're cleaning. All in all, this is a very, very good beer and kettle souring in the claw hammer system was easy breezy. I mean, it was, it was far easier than other kettle souring that I've done, um, especially with the temperature control. So it was, an, it was an awesome system to do this in and I'm glad I have this. Um, and it, I will likely just do this again next time I kettle sour. Philly Sour may be dead to me because of how easy uh, it is to kettle sour in this system. Um, now it's still really good yeast and if you need to sour something and you're not able to kettle sour, definitely do it. Going through two brew days can really, really be a lot. Um, so I don't blame you if you're not able to kettle sour, whether that's out of convenience or otherwise. I completely get it. Philly Sour is definitely a good option, but boy, it was, was it easy. So I'll definitely be doing more kettle sours, so expect more sours um, on the channel. If you're looking for something in particular, maybe let me know in the comments. Maybe I can get a little bit of inspiration and I'll brew a beer for you. But other than that, that'll do it for me. Thanks for viewing Just Brewing.